So uh, you'll, you'll notice the title, again, is You Knew. The title of the sermon is You Knew. And uh, this one is, um, this message to me is, is quite close. It, uh, it'll speak to you, I hope. Let's pray. Thank you, Father, for the blessings we've received this morning from the music that we've sang, the music that we've listened to. We love singing praises to you, Lord. We love praising you. And we're looking forward for that for all eternity. I pray this morning, Lord, that um, this message will speak to, us, speak to each of us and draw us each closer to you as we again look into your word and find things that apply to our lives in Jesus' name. Amen. I was reading one day, Councils to Teachers, and I found this statement. I thought it was powerful. On a certain occasion, when Betterton, a celebrated actor, was dining with Dr. Sheldon, Archbishop of Canterbury, the Archbishop said to him, I pray, Mr. Betterton, Tell me why it is that you actors affect your audiences so powerfully by speaking of things that are imaginary. My Lord, replied Betterton, with due submission to your grace, permit me to say that it is for this reason and it's plain. It all lies in the power of enthusiasm. We on the stage speak of things imaginary as if they were real. And you in the pulpit speak of things that are real as if they were imaginary. Isn't that a powerful statement? And that's exactly what takes place. You know, I think that's one of the reasons that people are so drawn to movies and drawn to those things because it's like they're making things that are imaginary real. And then in the pulpit, we speak about almost times we speak almost like with as if the Bible isn't, you know. And, uh, and I, I, I love one of the things that helps me to like really appreciate messages and things that I hear when, when I hear a preacher is when they're speaking about it, they speak about it as if it's real. And you know what I'm talking about. You've heard people speak about it. It's almost like they really don't believe it, but I'm just going to tell you this because I've got to give you something. I believe it to be true. And you know, um, the message today is going to go based on that idea of actually believing the Bible to be true. I'm going to submit that many of us don't really believe much of the Bible to be true. And I mean, now, we would never say that. We'd never say that. But in practice, we live that. We don't really believe what God's Word has to say. I'll give you some example today, and you guys will be like, uh, when, you, when you see this, like when I, when I first saw this and I see this example, I was like, yeah, that's me. I don't really believe. Shame on me, you know? And so I have to, I have to like, I, I, I believe now. But, uh, and you'll see as we go through here, okay? I mean, we all believe Jesus is coming, right? We'll say that. Um, <clears throat> I believe that the dead are going to be raised out of their graves. But anybody ever seen that happen? No, no but I still believe it, right? Yeah. Firmly. Uh, I remember one time this lady, she was coming to some meetings I was holding in Stanton, Kentucky, and, and she had originally believed that, you know, like when you're dead, you go float off somewhere, you know, and she'd heard the message about a resurrection, and I went to visit her in her home, and uh, th this is an example of somebody that really believes it to be true, right? Because, I mean, I've never heard anybody of us talk about this idea of a resurrection in the same way I heard this lady talk about it when she learned it from the, from the Bible, but um, I was talking with her and she was talking about her excitement about the idea of like the, the, the resurrection and one day her husband's going to be resurrected and she said his grave site they had this nice white gravel rock all over his grave site you know she's telling all about his grave and how she keeps it all nice and everything and she says i just can't wait till the resurrection and see gravel flying everywhere <laughs> you know i mean to her it's it, you know she absolutely believed it to be true you know and that's the way we should believe the bible now with that said let's go to the book of genesis chapter 17 Genesis, the 17th chapter, and I love this story. I love reading the story of Abraham um, and, and all about him. And <clears throat> You know, Abraham was a Babylonian. You know, you know what the, the, the word church isn't found until you get to the New Testament. You know that, right? And it's ecclesia is the, name of the, is, is the word. You know what the word church means? The, 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 trans, the word is translated church, what it actually means? Those that are called out. Isn't that interesting? And now with that thought, there's a whole different sermon on this, but with that thought, if you go back in the Bible, you'll notice God is constantly calling his people out. All the way to the very last message before, before it all wraps up, one last time he calls his people out. Come out of her, my people. The word church means the ones that are called out. To be different. And so Abraham, which is very interesting, the father of our faith, right, if you will, you know, as far as the, the, that first one, like the first one, that, we, that the, the children of Israel claims, you know, the, the father of the faith there, right? He was called out from Babylon. He was from Ur of Chaldee. He was a Babylonian. And he was called out to a, nation, to, to be, to, to a country, to a, to a city that he never got to see. But God promised it to him. And then one day he will see it, right? And, and we'll all go there together. He was called out to go to a country and a city whose builder and maker is God. And God has not stopped doing that. All right, so here he is, Abram, 
Abraham, uh, Genesis chapter 17. And let's go ahead and start reading on verse 4. Um, Abraham at this point is on his face, God speaking to him. In verse 4 it says, As for me, behold, my covenant is with you, and you shall be a father of many nations. And so therefore, neither shall your name any more be called Abram. Abram meant um, royal father or high father, right? Important. But now you're going to be called Abraham. Abraham means father of many nations or father of many, if you will. So his name was changed from Abram to Abraham. You know, it's, it's interesting to me that oh, we name, for, at least in America, you know, and where I'm from, we name our kids uh, basically just what we think we like. You know, um, like my name is Philip because my grandfather's middle name was Philip. My middle name is Keith because my dad's best friend when I was born was name was Keith, and he named me after his best friend, Philip Keith. And uh, I remember I told you about my friend Amakako Sikolo from Togo. And, you know, I mentioned him to you, right? And Amakako says, he used to say to me, oh, Paz, you, you Americans are all so funny. Your names don't mean anything. He says, my name, and it's Amakako Sikolo. I mean, it had a whole bunch of stuff in between. He says, my name? Where I'm from, everybody knows the village I'm from. They know about my family. They even know circumstances about my birth based on my name. And it's interesting because a lot of cultures, a lot of places, the names of the children or people's names actually is carrying a meaning of some special meaning. It's not just because it sounded good or you liked it. Like here in America, I, I, I mean, I don't like that we do this. We, we name our kids uh, a lot of times after Bible characters. I mean, there's probably a lot of Marks in here, a lot of Luke's. You know, you know, like that kind of thing, right? David's, <laughs> right? And, and, and Daniel's. And, and I like that. I think that's good. At least, at least we're doing something. We're not just like, oh, I like that name, you know? <clears throat> but in the Bible, names always carried meaning. They always carried meaning. You know, and that's why they would have their names changed. Jacob meant deceiver or he'll catch her, right? Deceiver. But then after he'd wrestled with God, God changed his name to Israel, which means overcomer with God, right? So it, the names actually carry meaning. Now, I just wanted to get that out there. So his name becomes Abraham. Now, God comes to Abraham and he says, now, you're going to have the father of many nations. And Abraham's like, yeah, I know. I, I, have, I have Ishmael. <laughs> and God says, no, it's going to come through Sarah. Let's pick it up now in verse 15. Verse 15 of Genesis chapter 17. God said to Abraham, as for Sarai, thy wife, Sarai means princess, my little princess. When Abraham called his wife princess. Isn't that cute? Thou shall not call her name Sarai, but Sarah, which is actually meaning very similar to the same thing, but it means, it means a woman of royalty, right? Because now she's not just a princess. She's going to be a queen, right? She's going to be the, the mother of nations. And then it goes on and says, I will bless her and I will give you a son also of her. Yea, I will bless her and she shall be a mother of nations Kings of people shall be of her. Now, does Abraham know he's talking with God? Yes, he does, because you read this a little bit later when God first started, or earlier rather, when God first started speaking to him, in verse 3 it says, Abraham fell on his face as God, and, talk, and God talked with him, saying, right? So Abraham here has gotten up at this point, I guess, right? And he's speaking with God. He knows he's speaking with God. And God says, Sarah, your wife, your old woman. You know, every people call themselves their wives their old lady. I don't like that term. But in this term, it would be right. She was old. She was like 99 right? She was old. And he says, now think about this. God says to you, your wife, Sarah, will have a son. Now, the next verse is amazing. Verse 17, Abraham fell on his face and laughed at God. Now, my friends, I mean, like God says, here's what's going to happen. Abraham's like, <laughs> You know, like, he's cracking up and laughing at God. Now, what should be the punishment? Huh? I mean, if you laugh at God like that, I mean, it's like lightning should just go, Poof, and Abraham is gone. But why does God not destroy Abraham? Now, this is interesting to think about. Why doesn't God destroy Abraham? I mean, what should be the punishment for laughing at God? The laughing at God promise. It should be immediate death, Right? But I want you to notice something, and this is going to be very, very powerful throughout the message today. God deals with us based on opportunities that we've had and opportunities that we have and our backgrounds, and he understands. This is, this is very interesting, very powerful, because Abraham was a Babylonian. What understanding, I mean, Abraham here, what evidence did he have so far up to this point that God was going to do everything he said he was going to do? None. 
God says, Abraham, come out from among your family, take your, take your wife and take your, uh, your flocks and leave. And Abraham goes into Sarah and says, uh, Sarah, you know, God says we're going to leave. Like my wife has had the same reaction. Where are we going? Well, he didn't really say, but we're going to go. What a faithful woman Sarah was. How many women here, if your husband come home one day and says, I know we've been here for a while. I know that life is good here and everything, but God has called us away. And, you know, I know that most of you'd be like, oh, where are we going? You know, like you expect that God has some mission for you. And your husband says to you, well, he really didn't say, but we're going to go. How many wives here would be going for that one? Yeah, one, right? Because you know your husband's listening to God pretty well, huh? And so, and so Sarah is now come out with Abraham, and he says, also, by the way, Sarah, you will have a son because God's told me, you know, all this kind of stuff, right? God has promised me that I'm going to have be a father of many nations or whatever, right? So we're going out to a land we don't know, but we'll get there one day, and we've been traveling around. How many of the promises have been fulfilled? None of them. I mean, at that point, when Abraham takes her out and they're out wandering around, none of the promises have been fulfilled that God had told him. And now God's promised him a son over and over and over. And Abraham's like, well, I got to figure out how to do this because God's not able to do it. So he goes in and Sarah says, I have an idea, son. <laughs> I have an idea. Uh, you want you, why don't you go in with Hagar? And I don't know how much persuasion that took, but he did. And, and uh, now he's got a son. And so they feel like they've accomplished it on their own. And God says, no, she's going to have a son. And Abraham falls on his face and laughs. And God is merciful. And it said, in, 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 and he said in his heart, shall a child be born unto him that is a hundred years old? And Sarah that is 90 years old, shall she bear? So she's 90 years old. And Abraham's like, that can't happen. God says, this is going to happen. And Abraham's response was like, God, that's impossible. <laughs> I like that. And Abraham's honest with God there, right? Abraham said unto God, oh, if Ishmael would just live before you. And God said, nope. Sarah, your wife, will bear you a son indeed, and you shall call his name Isaac. Now, do y'all know what Isaac means? Laughter or giggles, if you will, right? Like, he had to fight his way all the way through school. What's your name? Giggles. <laughs> Laughter, right? But why did, so who got punished here? Yeah, Abraham didn't get punished, right? Isaac got punished. I mean, it's a, it's a good name. There's people that named Isaac. It's a fine name now it is. But at the time, you can imagine, like, like you're going to have me name my kid Laughter? Right? You're going to laugh at me? Okay, you'll just name him Laughter. And he says, I will establish my covenant with him for an everlasting covenant and your seed after him. The Abraham again says, God says to him, as for Ishmael, I've heard, I've heard your, what you said. Behold, I have blessed him and I will make him fruitful and multiply him exceedingly. Twelve princes shall he beget. And I'll make him of him also a great nation. But my covenant will be established with Isaac. Okay? Now, about a year goes by. We're in chapter 18. It gets better. Chapter 18. Abraham's hanging out in his tent by, out, out by his tent one day. It's kind of hot, steamy day. He's sitting there in the shade, relaxed, and he sees these guys walking along. Chapter 18, verse 1. The Lord appeared unto him in the plains of Mamre, and he sat at the tent door in the heat of the day. And he lifted up his eyes and looked, and lo, three men stood by him. And when he saw them, he ran to meet them from the tent door and bowed himself to the ground and said, My Lord, if now I have found favor in thy sight, pass not away, I pray thee, from your servant. I love Abraham. He says, Let a little water, I pray, be fetched and wash your feet and, yourselves under the tr and rest yourselves under the tree. I will fetch a more... Now listen, he says, I will fetch a morsel of bread and comfort ye in your hearts after you shall pass on. And therefore are you come to your servant. And they said, okay, go ahead and do that. And Abraham hastened in, 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 in the tent and said, Sarah, fix these guys something to eat. <laughs> I'm so guilty of that, right? I, oh, no, no, no. Come over to my house for Sabbath lunch. It'll be just fine. Honey, do you got stuff fixed? <laughs> you know, when I first started pastoring, my, my first church, the, the district, uh, had, is in Louisville, South Louisville, Kentucky. And uh, about my second or third Sabbath, there was about probably 140 people there. And I got up that morning that, for, to preach, and I invited everybody over to my house for lunch. <laughs> my wife was like, I didn't tell her ahead of time. I said, Lord, the Lord will take care of it. We have, we have veggie links. You know, that'll be a fine. And so we had like 100 people show up at our house for Sabbath afternoon. And a bunch of people brought stuff, and everything turned out just fine. We had people sitting outside everywhere. I mean, there was, we were out in the country. You know, there, there were people on the porch, in the yard, out back, and every, in the house. I mean, there was no place for free. Oh, like 100 people. We had a wonderful Sabbath afternoon. So I've done my wife that way. I know how she, I know how Abraham, I, I follow him, following the steps of Abraham here, you know. So Abraham hastened and he said, Sarah, make these guys some food and quickly make three measures of meal, knead it and make cakes upon the hearth. 
And Abraham ran into the herd and fetched a calf tender and good and gave it to a young man and said, Now go, go cook this. And he took butter and milk and, and the calf and he, and he made it and he dressed it before them and he stood by them under the tree and they did eat. And they said unto him, Where is Sarah your wife? And he said, In a tent. And he said, I will certainly return unto thee according to the time of life and lo, Sarah thy wife shall have a son. And Sarah heard it in the tent door and was behind him. Now, put this on a little hook in your mind. Abraham and Sarah were old and well-stricken in age. Just remember that. Old and well-stricken in age. And it ceased to be with Sarah after the manner of women. In other words, and so Sarah laughed within herself. Now she's laughing at God, saying, After I am old, shall I have pleasure? And my Lord being old also? <laughs> the Lord said unto Abraham, why did Sarah laugh, saying, Shall I surely bear a child when I'm old? Is anything too hard for the Lord? And the time appointed, I will return unto thee according to the time of life, and Sarah will have a son. Then Sarah denied. Let me say that again. Then Sarah lied to God, saying, I didn't laugh, for she was afraid and said, Nay, but he said, nay, you did laugh. So what should be the punishment for laughing at God and then lying to God? <laughs> Lightning, you know, again. <clears throat> I mean, Sarah laughed at God and lied to God. Abraham laughed at God, but God is so merciful, doesn't punish them. Isn't that something? Does that bother anybody that he didn't do anything? Uh, you believe the story, right? Okay, we'll see. And then Sarah denied, saying, I did not laugh, but he said, you did. In verse 16, the men rose toward, went toward Sodom, and Abraham went with them and brought them on their way. And then you know the story from there, right? Now, so God didn't make this promise. It's going to take place. Now, let's go to Genesis chapter 21. Genesis chapter 21, and we can start in verse 1. The Lord visited Sarah, as he had said, and the Lord did unto Sarah, as he had spoken, for Sarah conceived and, and bare Abraham a son in his old age. And at the set time which God had spoken to him, and Abraham called the name of his son that was born unto him and who Sarah had born him, giggles, laughter, Isaac. And Abraham circumcised his son being eight days old, as God had commanded him. And Abraham was a hundred years old when his son Isaac was born unto him. And Sarah said, God has made me to laugh. Now, do you see the pun there? Like, I had a son, we named him Isaac, because God made me laugh. So that all that hear will laugh with me. Oh, did you hear? Old Abraham and Sarah had a son. <laughs> Who's the oldest two couple that's here today? The oldest couple that's here. Raise your hand if you're the oldest couple. Oh, come on. I'll just, right over here. You're going to have to be the oldest couple, right? No, you're not old. You know, I'm just look at the oldest couple you can see around you, okay? And imagine... God comes to you. I'm just picking on you all. You all can't have kids anymore, can you, right? So God comes to you and says, you're going to have a son. Would you laugh at him? And you know, it's interesting. Would you believe it? Oh, shame. Think about this. You know, we say we believe these stories, right? You're going to have a son, right? We say we believe these stories, but then when it applies to us, do we really believe it? I mean, you follow what I'm saying? I know this is a different idea. I mean, of course, you're not going to have a son, that kind of thing going on. But understand, do I really believe this story? And it says, and, and she said, who would have said that Abraham and Sarah should have given children suck? Or, uh, Abraham, I'm sorry, let me say it in the right way. Who would have said unto Abraham that Sarah would have given children suck? For I have borne him a son in his old age. And then the child grew. Now, we all say we believe this story, don't we? I mean, we all say we believe it. I mean, even though I kind of make a little bit of a joke thing here, like you're going to have a son over here, or you're going to have a son, you think, oh, no way, you know. But we believe this story to be true. Are you sure? Okay. I don't think we all really do, but I'm going to take your word for it. As a matter of fact, we're going to go to the New Testament now, and the Gospel of Luke. And now, this is, this is so good. Now, do you think that the people in the time of the Gospels being written all believe this story to be true? I mean, if, if you've done the same message, you stood up in front of this, this group of people in New Testament times, and you said, you know, this story took place, do you think everyone would say, we absolutely, positively believe that beyond a shadow of a doubt? For sure. I mean, these people, their whole economy, their whole system, their whole belief system is based on that story, 
right? Everything they believe is based on that story. Do you understand that? So they would all say for sure they believe the story. But I'm going to submit to you that they didn't really, many of them didn't really believe it. Or, well, let's just look at it. Even godly people, Luke chapter 1, verse 5, there was in those days of Herod, the king of Judea, a certain priest named Zacharias of the course of Abia, and his wife was of the daughters of Aaron, and her name was Elizabeth. And they were both righteous before God, walking in all the commandments and ordinances of the Lord, blameless. Now, were these just average people? Now, these were people, the descendants of Aaron, that totally, 100% believed in God, lived righteous lives, holy people, both of them. That's what the Bible says. And it says, they had no child. Verse 7, because Elizabeth was barren and they were now both well stricken in years. Isn't that interesting? How the wording is just the same. They were both really old. Too old to have kids. And it came to pass that while he executed the priest's office before God in the order of his course, according to the custom of the priest's office, his lot was to burn incense. And when he went into the temple of the Lord, so where was he at? If he's burning incense in the temple of the Lord? The holy place, right? Standing right before the curtain of the most holy place. And while he's there, the Bible says, and there appeared unto him an angel of the Lord standing at the right side of of the altar of incense showing what favoritism right so the angel standing at the right hand of the altar and he sees this and when Zacharias saw him he was troubled and fear fell upon him but the angel said unto him don't be afraid Zacharias for your prayer is heard so this angel comes to say what you've been praying for is now going to be answered <laughs> and your wife Elizabeth shall bear a son and you shall call his name John. Now, not only, not only does he have Bible evidence that God is perfectly capable of doing this, but he's been praying for it. <laughs> it's like, mercy. Uh, how many times do we pray that God will do something, but we don't really believe he's going to? Right? Like, Lord, please, please, I mean, we're praying, we're praying, but we don't, you know, it's almost like we're doing it because it's just in case something happens. I want to give God the credit. Right? Not really believing he's going to answer the prayer. And so Zacharias and his wife have been praying for a son. An angel shows up and he says, you're going to have a son, but I want you to notice his reaction. The angel goes on and says, um, you shall have joy and gladness and many shall rejoice at his birth. He shall be, be great in the sight of the Lord. He shall drink neither wine nor strong drink. He shall be filled with the Holy Ghost, even from his mother's womb. And many of the children of Israel shall turn to the Lord their God. And he shall go before him in power and spirit of Elias to turn the hearts of the fathers to the children and the disobedient to the, to the wisdom of the just and to make ready a people prepared for the Lord. And Zacharias said unto the angel, how shall I know this? For I'm an old man and my wife, well stricken in years. Zachariah says, you know, this all sounds wonderful, but it's not possible. What should be his punishment? This is interesting because Abraham laughed at God. Nothing happened. Sarah laughed at God then lied to God. Nothing happened. Zachariah just simply says, Lord, I don't see how this can happen. I'm just too old. And it says, and the angel answered and said to him, I'm Gabriel. It stands in the presence of God. I am sent to speak unto you and show you these glad tidings. And behold, you are now struck with dumbness and not able to speak until the day that these things are performed. Why is God so hard on Zacharias and so easy on Abraham and Sarah? Because he knew. He knew. He was claiming to believe the word of God, but he didn't really believe it just like many of us. Right? Wait, like... Can God still do today what he'd done back then? Can God still perform miracles? Does he still do these things? Will he work in our lives the same way he worked in the lives of people in the Bible? Will God do that? Can God do that? Now, we'll say very piously, of course, but in life, we don't practice that. I mean, we don't, as in many, don't. Like, we don't really believe that God will do these things. Just like, just like Zacharias, if you would have asked him 10 minutes before he went into the temple, do you believe the story of Abraham and Sarah? Yes. Do you believe Isaac was born supernaturally? Yes. Do you believe that they were too old to have kids and God, and God worked? Yes. Now, the angel comes and says, it's going to happen to you too. No, come on. And so God's like, all right, you're struck dumb. A little hard punishment, isn't it? I mean, he didn't fall on his face, but he had much more understanding and knowledge. He was raised in the church. Abraham came into the church out of Babylon. Are you following? Isn't that good? It's, it's interesting how that plays out. So, so now he's dumb for nine months. 
because he did not believe the word of God. But then what happens at the end of the nine months, he's able to speak again, and you can bet he praised God and didn't doubt him ever and again. Good stuff, isn't it? You know, I believe, and I think we're going to show up from the scriptures as we move through here in just a little bit, that God deals with us based on our experiences and opportunities. He deals with all of us the same way. That's why when I first come into the church, I could get away with things that you all can't get away with. Now, not that I wanted to get away with something, but God was winking at my ignorance, right? But I guarantee you this, if I was still acting and living the day like I did when I was baptized 22 years ago, the Lord would not be dealing with me the same way he's dealing with me now, right? And, and we'll show this from the Bible. You know, James four seventeen. therefore to him that knows to do good and does not do it, to him it is sin. You know what you can take from that again, when you read a positive statement in the Bible, the opposite is also true, right? So him that doesn't know, to him it's not sin. Remember when Jesus said, the the scribes and Pharisees, some of them come to him one time and says, are we blind also? And he says, if I had not spoken unto you, you would be okay. But now that I've spoken unto you, you're in trouble. I'm just paraphrasing, right? Because they had now known, they did know they're not blind, even though they were blind, right? But they're purposely blind. So if we don't know, how about this? Will we still be held accountable for what we, what, what we don't know? Well, maybe. Have you read the book of Hosea? And it, it's particularly Hosea chapter 4. And I'm just going to turn here real quick. Hosea chapter 4, Daniel. Then you go right after that, you get to find the book of Hosea. Okay, and, and Hosea chapter 4, in verse 6 particularly, and I want you to hear this. The Bible says in Hosea 4, 6, my people are destroyed for lack of knowledge. Now, that doesn't sound a bit fair. God, why would you destroy people for lack of knowledge? But the text goes on. Because you've rejected knowledge, I will reject thee. And thou shalt be no priest unto me, saying, thou hast forgotten the law of thy God. I will also forget thy children. So he's just simply saying here, you're destroyed because you had opportunity to know and you didn't follow it. So, yeah, we will, God winks at our ignorance, so to speak. But at the same time, if you're purposely ignorant, God's not going to wink at that, right? I, I've actually, I've actually, uh, my family, they, you know, I'm the only one in my family that's a Christian, right? It's my direct family. I'm talking about mother, brother, sister, that kind of thing, right? And I have directly tried to, like, share, and, and my mom is like, I don't want to hear, you know, my family. They don't want to hear because they, I believe they, they understand at least that principle of knowledge brings responsibility. So if I don't know, I'll be okay. But if you reject it, it's the same thing as knowing it and not doing it. And that's what we're learning from the Bible here. Now, in Genesis chapter 3, it's, it's interesting. We've got the story there of, uh, and we'll look at that more this evening some, but in Genesis chapter 3, we have the story of Adam and Eve. Now, I want you to notice there, it says in verse 1, the serpent was more subtle than any beast of the field, which the Lord God had made. And he said unto the woman, Yes, God said, you shall not eat of every tree of the garden. The woman said unto the serpent, We may eat of the fruit of the tree of the garden, but of the fruit of the tree which is in the midst of the garden, God has said, You shall not eat it, neither shall you touch it, lest you die. Now, we don't know how that story goes, right? She took her the fruit. And then Adam took her the fruit. Have you read what the Bible says in 1 Timothy chapter 2? I want you to notice something that happens here. 1 Timothy chapter 2, verse 13. Adam was first formed in Eve. Adam was not deceived. But the woman being deceived was in the transgression. Notwithstanding, she shall be saved in childbearing if they continue in faith and charity and holiness and sobriety. Now, here's what's interesting. Adam did it willfully. She was deceived. But both got equal punishment. The wages of sin is death. And so I want you to notice, both of them got kicked out of the garden. Both of them got the punishment of death. She got the women. You just, I'm telling you, it's her fault. You have to go through what you go through. I mean, let's put credit where credit's due. Put the blame where it goes, right? It's her fault that you have to go through what you have to go through. Guys, you know, um, in our culture, it's kind of different because, it, you know, Adam's punishment was, you know, work in the field and do the gardening and stuff. And, you know, I don't mind doing that. You know, I would much rather do that than what you women have to go through. <laughs> Amen. Right? All right. And, and so now notice here, okay, so he says, it, it says here, they're both equally punished, even though one was deceived and the other, the other one done it willfully. You know, Ad, actually, you study about that, and Adam couldn't see how God could fix things, so he, he done it with what he did. Because he couldn't see how God could fix things. He didn't believe that God could take care of things. Both cases, one was deceived, the other one did it purposely. Both cases were punished. So what if someone chooses to remain ignorant? Is there any difference between someone merely being ignorant and someone who is willfully ignorant? Yeah, there's a huge difference. Yeah, between someone that's willfully ignorant and one that, that, that 
is they, they don't know, right? I mean, when I was a heathen, I didn't know. And, and you know, I was rejecting people try to witness to me. And this is an amazing thing. You, you, I'm going to give you something here. It's just a kind of off the side. You have such an advantage after you hear this. When I was a heathen, and, and I read, read in the Bible where God's no respecter of persons. You read that? So he doesn't love me more than anybody else, okay? And somebody would try to witness to me in some way, and I'd be like, yeah, whatever, get out of here, you know? And that night, it would never fail. I'd lay down on my bed, and that person's voice would come into my head. <laughs> like, why is that happening? Why is that person's voice coming to my head? Of all the activities of that day, why would that thing in that day come into my mind? Because it's the Spirit of God. And, and, I, and I think about that, and I think, when people reject me when I try to say something, can you imagine having my voice in your head at night? Because <laughs> I know God's doing the same thing, isn't he? I mean, he's still working on them. He wants to work on them, right? And so even though I was ignorant, and, but God was trying to work on me, and, you know, and he, that, well, he was taking me that direction until finally you know, the, the, plant, the seeds were planted, the fruit come up, and he, he sent a little girl into my life that witnessed to me, so I married her. All right. Now, I want you to listen to this statement from Gospel Workers. This is Gospel Workers, um, page 158. Oh, no, no, before, go there. I'll, I'll go there in a minute. I'll give you that statement in a minute because I, I want to throw this out there. You know the idea of the mark of the beast? You get it in the hand and the forehead. And God's mark is only where? In the forehead. And, and I've contemplated this a lot. And I think this goes right along with this. Listen to this. The people that receive God's mark in the forehead, they're doing it because they're consciously worshiping God. That's why no one will receive the mark of God in the hand because it's like this. If you receive the mark of the beast in your forehead, some people are going to receive it in their forehead because they consciously believe they're doing God's will. Okay? With the mark of the beast, they consciously believe they're doing God's will. Now, everyone here that knows what the mark of the beast is, you understand how that works, right? They're consciously believing they're doing God's will. But what about the one in the hand? You're going to have individuals that's going to say, I don't care about this God thing, but everybody else is doing this, and this is the, this is the thing to do. If I want to get ahead in this world, I've got to do it. They're going to do it because they have to secularly. The hand is secular, right? So they're just accepting the mark of the beast. They're, they're doing what needs to be done because that's what they have to do to get by. But no one's going to receive the mark of God, the seal of God, just to get by. But no one's going to look at that and say, you know what? I think I'm going to go with those people because that looks like the right thing to do. So some people that receive the mark of the beast will receive it willfully. Some will receive it ignorantly, but both will be equally punished. Is that making sense? But now the people that receive it um, ignorantly will be purposely ignorant. Because the gospel goes. Everyone has an opportunity. Did, uh, here's something you'll find interesting. Okay, The gospel that goes into all the world for a witness, the Bible says for a witness, and then the end comes, that means everyone will have an opportunity to hear, but maybe not everyone will hear. You know, we, we have this burden to preach the gospel to everybody. And, and I've heard people say, well, you know, we're not, we're not reaching everybody. My friends, everyone has the opportunity for the gospel. That's a witness, right? It's not that everyone will hear. I mean, how do you do that? Like, if I purposely say I'm not going to listen, then will the gospel ever be fulfilled, the commission? Yes, it will be fulfilled because they'll have an opportunity to hear. You see what I'm saying? It's the opportunity, okay? And so with this, with this mark of the beast thing, it plays into that. Now, with that said, um, some people will choose to remain ignorant, and there is a difference. Now, the gospel worker statement. Listen to this. This is talking about Moses. Now, you guys will like this. If any fail to comply with the requirements given by the Lord to Moses and by Moses to the people... They were punished with death. It would be no excuse to plead that they knew not the na nature of these requirements, for they would only prove themselves willingly ignorant and would receive their just punishment for their transgression. If they did not know the will of God concerning them, it was their own fault. They had the same opportunities to obtain the knowledge imparted as others of the people had. Therefore, their sin of not knowing, not understanding, was as great in the sight of God as if they had heard and then transgressed. Gospel Workers, page 158. Think about that. So it's simply saying this. They had every opportunity to know the truth, but if they didn't know it, it was their own fault. So if they got punished with death, so be it. They couldn't go and say, well, I didn't know. Because to say, I didn't know, is exactly the same thing as saying, I didn't care. And my friends, it'll be the same way at the very end of this world. It's the same way right now for all of us sitting here. For anybody sitting here right now, listening to this message, to say, I didn't know, is the equivalent of saying, I didn't care, because you had every opportunity. To say, I didn't know, means I don't really care to know what God's will is in my, for my life. Right? And many people like to claim ignorance. They like to claim, I'm not convicted on that. How about that one? Well, the Bible says it. But yeah, but I'm not convicted on that. That's willful ignorance. All right? You know, and here's a good example of how this plays out. In Acts chapter 17, I'm going to hurry along here. Acts 17, Paul speaking here on Mars Hill to 
a, a bunch of guys worshiping idols. Now, these people that were worshiping idols, what was their chance of going to heaven? Pretty slim, you'd say? Is it at least possible? Yeah, let's look at that right here. Acts chapter 17, verse 22. Paul stood in the midst of Mars Hill and said, You men of Athens, I perceive that in all things you're too superstitious. What a great way to start a sermon. <laughs> like, who does this guy think he is insulting me? For as I passed by, verse 23 of Acts 17, I beheld your devotions. I found an altar with this inscription, To the unknown God. Now listen. To whom therefore you ignorantly worship, him I declare unto you. Were these people worshiping the true God? Yes, first person I've ever heard say it right. Yes, they were doing it ignorantly. And so they were worshiping the true God, they just didn't know it. Now, as that takes place, is there a possibility, as these, as before Paul preached to these people, is it possible for them to be saved in the kingdom of God? Yes, worshiping ignorantly, living up to the light they had. They, and these guys had gods for everything. They didn't know the true God, but they were looking for the true God. And they said, well, just in case we don't have the true God, let's have an altar here to the unknown God, and we got them all covered. I don't know why they didn't just get rid of all of them, just have the one to the unknown God. And then they would have truly been worshiping the true God ignorantly, right? And, so it, and then it goes on. It says, Paul starts preaching to them about the true God. And by the way, he's preaching the three angels' message. He preaches about the creator God, and he ends up talking about judgment. Same, you've started three angels' message, right? It's very powerful. Listen to this. God that made the world. What's he doing? Telling them about the true God, the God that made the world, preaching about the creator, God, calling them to the creator. Seeing he is the Lord of heaven and earth, dwells not in temples made with hands, neither is he worshiped with men's hands as though he needs anything, seeing he gives to all life, breath, and all things. And he just goes on down through explaining to them about the true God. Now, in verse 30, he, after he tells them, quit worshiping idols, Right? worship the true God, don't need to worship these idols, There's a, the, the true God doesn't need all this stuff. Like, think about it. You're taking the, the God that created you and creating something to look like the God that created you. It doesn't make any sense. Then after he preaches this message, look at verse 30. At the times of these ignorance, God winked at. What was he saying to them? When you're ignorantly doing this, God overlooked it. But now commandeth all men everywhere to Repent. Now, if they would have continued from that point forward, worshiping these idols, could they be saved? No. Because now they would be purposely throwing out God's truth. They would be purposely ignorant. They've had opportunity. It's been, it's been presented to them, right? Now it's time to get rid of these idols and worship the true God. And then he goes on and says, because he's appointed a day which he will judge the world. You see, there the judgment. Isn't that powerful? He's preaching the three angels' message. So Paul does this. Now, as the truth of the gospel goes into all the world, Will do you think there'll be anyone able to claim, like these guys, mere ignorance? No. They will all have opportunities. Now, with that said, let's go and finish this up here with the book of Daniel. Now, I'm just going to highlight a couple things in the book of Daniel to get to where we want to be. You remember Nebuchadnezzar? I, looking forward to meeting Nebuchadnezzar in heaven, I've got questions for him. What in the world were you thinking? I want you to think about this. You had a young, you had this dream, right? And this young man comes, before he tells you what you dreamed, he told you what you were thinking when you went to bed that night. Remember reading that? Last night when you went to bed, you were wondering what the end of the world was going to be like in your kingdom. That's what Daniel tells him. That would have got my attention immediately. Right? And then he gives him the dream and the interpretation. And Nebuchadnezzar wants to worship Daniel. <laughs> and Daniel's like, no, 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 you're all messed up. Worship God. I didn't do this. God did, right? And so Nebuchadnezzar, was he converted at that point? No. Very next chapter, what's he do? He builds this image on the plain of Dura. And he says, okay, everybody, come out and worship the image. And the three Hebrews walk out there. And then he says, bow down and worship the, worship, worship the image. And they say, we're not doing this. He says, oh, yeah, I'll make you do this, right? And he, so he builds the fire, all right, and gets it super hot. And he casts the three guys in there, bound them up. And the guys that threw them in were killed, obeying the wrong king, right? And he looks in there, and what does he say? Yeah, I, and one is what? Like the Son of Man or the Son of God. The Son of God, right? How did he know anything about the Son of God? Somebody had to witness to him. And so he sees this take place, this miracle, and he gets them out there, and he's like, guys, this is wonderful, wonderful, great. Your God is something else. But he's not converted. Why is God so patient with him? Like Abraham, he was a Babylonian. He was raised in staunch Babylonianism, right? And so God's patient, so patient. And then it, it goes on, and then when you get to Daniel chapter 4, he goes crazy for seven years and eats the grass. And after that, he's like, okay, I'm converted. Now, here's the thing. 
When Nebuchadnezzar is converted, I'll just read Daniel 4, verse 37. I would read more, but the, the time's running out on us. Now I, Nebuchadnezzar, praise and extol and honor the king of heaven, all whose works are truth, and his ways are judgment. And those that walk in pride, he's able to abase. Was Nebuchadnezzar converted? Yeah. Do you, ever, do you have any doubt he'll be in heaven? I don't. I think for sure he'll be in heaven. And so I want to say, Nebuchadnezzar, what in the world were you thinking? Why weren't you converted after the three Hebrews? I'll give you a pass on Daniel. But why weren't you converted after three Hebrews in a fiery furnace? And, and, you know, what's the matter with you? What were you thinking, right? And he may say something like this. This is true. I should have been. I should have given my heart to the Lord then. But where are all the other people that said they believe this story to be true? Where are they at? Multitudes, right? Now, look what happens in, in Daniel chapter 5. Verse 1, Belshazzar the king made a great feast to thousands of his lords and drank wine before the thousands. Belshazzar, while he was tasting the wine, commanded to bring the golden and silver vessels of his father Nebuchadnezzar and take, taken out of the temple that was in Jerusalem. And the king and his, and his princes and his wives and his concubines might drink therein. They brought the golden vessels that were taken out of the temple, the house of God, which was in Jerusalem. And the king and his princes and his wives and his concubines drank in them. And he drank wine and he praised the gods of, listen, gold, silver, brass, Iron. Does that sounding familiar? And then it finishes with wood and stone. And, and you know, it's interesting because that image would have been standing on the earth. Wood and stone. So I, I really believe that, you know, he's, he's actually mocking literally what took place. Right? Mocking God. Now, Belshazzar, grandson of Nebuchadnezzar. I can tell you without a doubt from personal experience that Nebuchadnezzar, after his conversion, did not let anybody that he ran into not know about his Lord and Savior. He told everybody. And I can guarantee you, as a matter of fact, Belshazzar, I believe, was named after Belteshazzar. Daniel. Their names mean basically the same thing, right? I don't remember exactly how the names are going. I forgot right now off my head, and I don't have it in my notes, so you'll just have to go with that, right? So you have Belshazzar and Belteshazzar. I believe he's the namesake. He has all the information. He was raised. Are you ready for this? He was raised a Seventh-day Adventist. Okay, a Christian. Like, don't tell me he wasn't raised in the church. He had every opportunity to know. His grandfather, without a doubt, told him these truths. But then he gets to this place, and he starts mocking God. And I love what happens, because as this takes place, the handwriting on the wall, right? No one can read the handwriting. And, and it says, actually says that his knees knock together. <laughs> I love that. He's so scared. You ever been that scared? That your knees shake? And so he's terrified. And so then they call in Daniel and the queen mother, which I think was um, Nebuchadnezzar's wife that was still living, right? So she, <coughs> she comes in and says, well, call Daniel. And so verse 13, I, I got to skip some good stuff, but verse 13, then Daniel was brought in before the king and the king spake and said unto Daniel, are you that Daniel, which are the captives of Judah, Judah whom the king, my, the king, my father brought out of Jewelry? I have heard of you. Oh, baloney. You know exactly who he is. You know, he's trying to play him down. You're, you're one of those captive slaves that we brought, weren't you? He knew who Daniel was. He was, a, he was the chief leader of the wise men, right? He's a retired old man, but he's belittling him. And I love Daniel's response. Daniel or anybody, when they come in before the king, what was the, what was the um, salutation? Oh, king, live forever. Not Daniel here. He comes in and gives this guy a spanking. Like he's old grandpa spanking the kid. Here's what he says. Um, Daniel, seven, Daniel, Daniel 5, 17. Again, skipping some good things because we got to get this done. Daniel answered and said before the king, let your gifts be to yourself and thy rewards to another. I will, I will read the writing unto the king and I'll make known in him the interpretation. Now listen to what Daniel says. O thou king, the most high God, gave Nebuchadnezzar your father a kingdom and a majesty and glory and honor. And for the majesty he gave him, all people and nations and languages trembled and feared before him. Whom he slew, he, whom he wanted to, he slew. Whom he wanted to keep alive, he would. And whom he would set up, he would. And whom he would put down, whatever he wanted to do. But when his heart was lifted up, and his... What's Daniel doing here? Yeah, telling, telling him the story that he already knows. Remember when Stephen done the same thing? Went over the history of Israel, and then they killed him? All he was doing is reminding them, this is why you guys, this is why, that when Stephen was, right before he was killed, he was just reminding them, this is why you're guilty, because you know all this. And so Daniel says, this is why you're guilty. 
But his heart was lifted up and his mind hardened in pride and he deposed from his kingly throne and they took him from his glory. And he was driven from the sons of men and his heart was made like the beast in a dwelling and was in the wild asses. (coughs) They fed him with grass like ox. His body was wet with the dew of heaven until he knew that the most high God ruled in the kingdom of men and it, it was appointed over whom he will. Now verse 22. And you, his son, O Belshazzar, has not humbled your heart, though you knew it. And so what happens to him? Immediately he's struck down. That night. Why was God so merciful to Nebuchadnezzar and so hard on Belshazzar? Because he knew. And my friends, sitting here right now, you know. We like to look at how God deals with people in the world oftentimes and say, well, if he's going to deal with them like that, he should deal with us the same way. The difference is you know. God is holding his people that has opportunities to hear his word and say we believe his word, you're held to a different standard because you know. You've had opportunities you know. And it should be a blessing to do God's will, not how much can I get away with and still maybe make it to heaven. Our view is, God, I know what your will is. Please give me the power and strength to live my life for you because we know. The title of the message this morning is you knew. And my friends, you can go through your Bible and find many places where these people knew. And that's why God punished them in the way he did. Let's pray. Father in heaven, you've given us the privilege and blessings of knowing so many things. And with knowing and understanding, with knowledge comes responsibility. I thank you, Lord, for your love and your grace and your mercy that you show continually to us, even though we know and make mistakes. You're so merciful. But Lord, there is a point to where you will not let man cross. And I pray that none of us will ever even come close to that line. Lord, give us the heart to love and serve you until the day we see you coming. In Jesus' name, amen.